Dale's got a beautiful uh, model of the uh, Rio Grande Southern Second District from Durango to Dolores, and um, he is a perfectionist. He, he may not agree with that, but he, yeah, he is. And his layout looks stunning. It's got beautiful photo backdrops that um, seamlessly merge into foreground scenery, and it runs flawlessly. A derailment is a very rare thing indeed on this layout. So Russ and Guy and several other people on the call today had the pleasure of actually operating the layout just two days ago on Sunday afternoon. And well, I, I was dispatching and shouting at people, but the other people were running trains. And it was truly a delight to run, utterly reliable. So with that, I'll hand this session over to Dale if you want to share your screen. And uh, I think you're unmuted. Uh, go ahead, Dale. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, Robin. And um, let me uh, share the screen here. We'll get going here. Let's see here. So uh, good evening, everybody. Tonight, I'd like to share some projects that were recently completed on the um, layout on the Rio Grande Southern Second District. And as Robin said, the second district was between Durango and Rico. Um, what really drew me to this area was the, the wide open spaces and the fact that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, agriculture, coal, just, just a lot of commodities moving in this part of the, of the railroad. And so it created a, a really neat um, layout for operations. So with that, why don't we go ahead and get started? So it, this is a broad overview of three areas, West Durango, Leitner Creek, and Hespers. It, it is not in detail, but it's a, it's an overview of, of what these projects were. So this is the layout itself and its design. And the three areas that we're going to look at are West Durango, right here. We're going to go up gray just a little bit here to Leitner Creek, where the, the, the Twin Buttes are the background. And then we're going to head over this way to Hesperus and this coal mine right here. So these are the three areas. And you see this is the entrance. And the layout is uh, 42 feet long and varies from 16 down to 11 and a half feet wide. So this is the West Durango engine terminal, uh, the prototype. It was actually constructed when the Rio Grande Southern went into receivership in 1929. So it's a little bit outside my era. I like to model the, the 1920s. And this was constructed around 1930. And it was done to get away from um, the fees that the Denver Rio Grande Western was charging the Rio Grande Southern for maintenance of its locomotives. So where was it? And for me, it was the only option because I just couldn't fit in the, the Durango terminal. Uh, I mean, despite the fact that I obviously had a lot of room, but um, there were certain things I wanted to get into the layout design and it just didn't allow for having a, a big ter uh, engine terminal. Um, so we'll take a look at the e early scene. Um, what I went through for the backdrop, uh, the structures, lucky break and then finalizing the scene. So I often went up Highway 160 out of Durango wondering where the West Durango terminal was. And of all things, uh, thanks to Google Earth, it turns out that it was right here. And every time I went and visited Soundtracks, when I came out, I was looking straight at it and didn't realize it. So whenever you're in the Durango area, this is this is where it's at. You can tell because this is the stream that went around the terminal. Um, and it's it's you know it's always fun trying to track down where these these places are. So here's the track plan for West Durango. And it's it's pretty straightforward and simple, but it it it's a nice spot to be able to, to park locomotives. And uh, it's something I really needed to have done. So this is this is how it was a number of years ago. And I've used mock-ups a lot 
um, in, in the construction of this layout, and, and West Durango was, was no exception. So this is, is it right here. So the first thing was to uh, just begin working on some of the hard shell and redoing. You know, I often do a, an overall hard shell with the idea of coming back later and, and, and finessing it. And, and this is the case here with this stream. So we're going to leave that for a moment. And while working on the hard shell, um, I had to work on the backdrop. My evenings were the backdrop. And this was a really difficult one. Um, I tried several trips to get what I thought would work as a good backdrop for West Durango. And in the end, of course, the, 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 the real deal, it's hard to beat. The trouble is, of course, you have a lot of uh, industry now. It's, it's changed a lot. But I didn't have much of a choice. And so I went with this and using Photoshop and, and cloning tools was able to get it to an acceptable point where it would where it fit the scene. And here you can see um, where the backdrop has been just kind of just taped up in place to make sure that it looks right. And um, also, I want to mention the structures. These wonderful structures were built by John McKenzie of uh, McKenzie Brothers Timber. And he had a, a very nice um, shelf layout of West Durango and hadn't seen it in a while. And I asked him about it and we were able to come to an agreement and I acquired some very nice structures that fit in just perfectly. So here, you know, we've worked the, um, um, we've worked the, the backdrop in and we also had to redo some of the track work to fit the, um, the engine house. So this was redone a little bit, but you know, we're, we're getting there. We're, we're getting there, working its way there. So we throw in some basic scenery. And of course, it, it's always um, working the seam here is always important trying to get the foreground to, um, you know, not look abrupt than when you're going into the backdrop. So we're back to the stream and here you can see we, ha we now have a meandering stream and, and that's important. It, 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 nothing's better than nature and, and you really want to emulate it as much as possible. So moving along, now we're gonna, you know, we got some, some water in there and um, the uh, trees. So then they had the entrance to the staging. And, and this was a problem. As you can see, it really was an eyesore. It, it really jumped out at you when you had the lights on back there. And it's not something you wanna have take away from your other work. So the first thing we tried was I called it the black hole solution. It's just the black styrene put back there. And all it did was create this black dot. So that wasn't gonna work. So in the end, I just printed out some more of the backdrop and uh, pasted it on some styrene and then just uh, curved it around and added a little of uh, a little scenery there. And now it's it's not perfect, but it's better than it was. And then when you start adding in the trees and other scenery, it uh, tends to disappear. So this is the finished scene, and it, it's yeah, it, it's it's worked out really well. In the foreground, I'm on, I wanted to mention here in the foreground, these posts are actually uh, from cedar branches. You just cut a one inch section off of a cedar branch and it actually splits just like regular, like a split rail fence. Something, you, you know, if you have cedars, you can give it a try. It works really well. 
Okay. So next we're going to talk about the Leitner Creek Trestle. And um, as, as I say here, it's one of my favorite photographs. Uh, the, the, the four the four six O's that the Rio Grande Southern acquired from the Florence and Cripple Creek, I, I think proportion are just beautiful locomotives, number 20, 22, and 25. So this is, um, again, where is Leitner Creek? Uh, we're working upgrade from West Durango. Uh, I'll show you the scene that led to me going into photo backdrops. Uh, again, making do with what you have. I thought there was too many clouds, but we worked around that. And then the trestle, working that in. So here we have an, another Google Earth. And Durango is over in this area, so you're coming up Highway 160. And the main line was here. And then it curved right around here and crossed the road what became the road and then it worked its way down up continuing upgrade into wildcat canyon and eventually porter where there was a big coal mine so again this just shows you the relationship of where lightner creek trestle is in regards to west durango and the rest of the layout Yes, the scene that drove me to photo backdrops. I was really going to paint the backdrops. The trouble is I don't know when to stop. And when I got to the point of putting in quarter inch high trees with branches and leaves, I knew that I had to try something different or I would never get this done. And that's when I decided to try the photo backdrop methods. So on a trip to Durango at one of the conventions, um, a friend of mine and I, uh, we scrambled up to this, to the grade here, and I was able to get a nice panorama of the Twin Buttes area. And so here's a rough panorama. And, and this was, again, this was a panorama. I wasn't sure whether it would work or not. Uh, there's a lot of clouds, you know, cloudy day. Um, the, it wasn't that long and I was hoping for a much longer backdrop so I could work it down into West Durango, but it just, it just wasn't going to be, the, the, you only had so much room to, to do a panoramic shot with a tripod and a camera, but this is what I had and I didn't have to do a lot of, uh, cloning out of any modern things. It's a beautiful scene, a uh, beautiful country. <clears throat> so when you're doing backdrops, one of the things you have to do is, is you try to get the right look. You want the right perspective. You want to you want the scene to flow into the backdrop. You don't want the backdrop to overwhelm the scene in front. Uh, so if you can push it back, then you make the scene deeper. If if you want it closer, of course you you, you can create a bigger image. Uh, finding the right balance is interesting because if you make a smaller image, it's generally uh, sharper. If you're going to expand it, then it might get a little softer. So it's, it's trying to find that right balance. And so the way I do it is to print out just eight by 10 uh, prints of different areas on the backdrop and then just tape them up and, and until I get it to where it looks correct. So here you can see it in place. It still has a lot of clouds there. And uh, it gives you that perspective. That's what number the locomotive 41 is doing there. It's just, it's, you know, just so you can get the feel for it and to make sure that you, you, you've got a, a nice scene. And again, this is uh, another look at it. And, and in this case, so let's, let's trim the clouds and we're gonna see what happens. So I use number 11 X-Acto blades <laughs> down on my hands and knees and, and cut away the clouds. And I start light, don't trim too much. And I just keep at it until it looks right. 
And so this is how it came out. So, you know, you can take a panorama with a lot of clouds and in the end make it look pretty good if you just take your time uh, and, and, and work away at it. So here you got a comparison of, uh, with all the clouds and then the clouds trimmed away. So I mentioned the, the West Durango uh, backdrop and the fact that the Twin Buttes backdrop didn't go far enough. So there, there's a, a transition here where they overlap. And as you can tell, they're, they're different. Uh, West Durango obviously very close uh, to the scene and this one is, is, is farther away. So here there's just gonna be vegetation put in, uh, woodland scenics, uh, scenery you know scenery uh, materials and uh, scrub oak and stuff that, that will hide that and you know you're not going to see it so again like the best plate best laid plans you know I, I roughed it all in and then found that I had to go back and and really redo a lot of this um, once I really got down to specifics because um, also when there was a small, road here, I want to say road, more like a, a wagon trail here in the early years, and I wanted to get that in there as well. So I had to redo everything. So as I got redoing that, I was working on the trestle and working on the trestle deck. Um, I always test the deck. I want it to be as strong as possible. Um, you, you just have to have it strong because the track work is so important. Uh, without good track work, uh, and if things start derailing, or it, it, or you, the transitions here aren't smooth, you, you run into problems, and then it gets harder and harder to fix once the trestle's in place. And so here you can see some progress on the on the trestle. And there's a little road. There's going to be more fence that go into here. And, and so here's more of the progress and additional vents uh, and plus the stream. And in the back, I didn't mention it earlier, but the backdrop didn't come all the way down into this area. So I had to build a hard shell back up and then curve the stream around so it disappeared behind this hill. So again, it, it's getting that right perspective. So here's how it looks today. There's still more to do in the scenery area, um, but it's really coming along. I think it looks pretty good. And there's gonna be more scrub oak along this hillside, just like there was in the, in the prototype. I've been awfully tempted to leave this area as it is, is because that it looks very nice as a meadow that just works right into the backdrop. But there's there's plenty, there's always more to do. Always. So let's go to the Hesperus Fuel Company. And this is a picture of the early coal tipple, the coal mine there at Hesperus. There was two <clears throat> two shafts, and this is the, the early one, and then there was a much more complex one that was built a little later, but I believe that this early one uh, lasted until the end as well. But this is this is the one I had room for, and so this is what I had to go with. So what's new at Hesper's? Well, it was the first part of the layout to have scenery, but the mine scene wasn't finished or the stream vegetation. And um, fortunately, there was no backdrop to deal with in this, in this project. But it did require planning, mock-ups, some unplanned modifications and scenery. And then it turned out to be an operational challenge with the operating and, and switching out the, the tipple. So here again, and this is the entrance, and obviously this is the first thing you see when you walk in the layout is a Hester Fuel Company. So it was a little bit of an embarrassment for many, many years 
not to have anything there at all. So the location, and to give you uh, an idea of where Hesperus is, this is Highway 160, where if you continue to the right, you'll end up eventually in Durango. If you continue to the left, you'll, you'll end up in Mancos, Colorado, um, not far from the Mesa Verde Cliff Dwellers uh, Park. And then Hesperus, the main line, the Rio Grande Southern the main line came in this general direction here and continued on through heading up this way. They had a, a very tight curved spur with track for loading that came down this way. And this here, you can see the remedial area where the coal mines were. It lasted until the mid, uh, I guess the mid 1920s. Now here's a photo from Highway 141 looking at the site. And as I mentioned, it was unfinished for years. So here's, this is what you looked at. You looked at a blank scene here for many years. Not much there, just the basics. So generally when it comes to structures like this, I'll do a foam board mock-up. I'll put as much detail as I can in there so I have a very good idea as to how it's gonna to come together. And, it just, and it's a, just a great planning tool. And then you sit down and you just work through it. And while you're working at it, you're thinking of how it's going to fit and how it's going to look. And, and I can't overemphasize the importance of, of, of doing things like this. So here again, we're, we're going to take a look again. And again, you can see the mock-up. I've added some foam. This is going to be the tailings pile. Um, I think I'd put this other foam piece in there like, well, what if there's rock there just to see what it looked like. Jigs. Uh, this is another one of the things that I'm a firm believer in. Um, this one jig is, was made to be able to do all the, all the bents for that coal mine. And you can, you can see how I, I label it here on the right so that you know I knew which bent was which based on the plan I drew up. So another jig and this shows the uh, the deck being constructed. Actually it's, it is constructed in this in this uh, picture here. This is just code code 40 rail is put down. So again, okay, we're, we're, it's moving along and we're checking it twice. Make sure everything is going to fit right. And as the title says, a problem. And what, when I got this thing pretty well along and put in place, I realized that having the mine entrance right at the top of this hillside maybe wasn't the best idea. Um, so I thought, well, I'm going to have to do something. So I'm going to have to raise this hillside. And so it was, you know, adding, adding a piece of masonite and building it up. And again, it was you know, trying to find the right height so it looked right. I was concerned also about making this steeper uh, and, and keeping it believable. So this is my method. Probably doesn't work for everybody, but it works for me. It just shows you um, building it up. <laughs> so in this scene, it's built up. The um, gauze is in place, the hard shell, the Hydrocal has been painted over it, and I don't, I don't install castings when they're wet on the seam. I generally make the castings, and then after they're hard, then I'll, I'll, 
I'll place them on the scene until I'm happy with what the location is. And as you can see here, you use just push pins to keep things in place and see what it looks like. Uh, and here's just extra castings as I'm fooling around, just trying to, 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 to find, just to make it look right. So here we have it, uh, it's, it's pretty well along. Actually, the, the mine's in place. Some of the scenery's going in. Uh, I'm checking it with the, the locomotive and the cars to continue to make sure everything fits and works right. And this is the mine entrance. And it, if you remember, you know, this, this was the casting I had sitting over top of it in a couple of slides before. I liked the way it looked. I thought it looked natural. Um, when you go out to, you know, out in the, and look at coal mines, the seams are often below layers of limestone and things like that. And yes, it was individual rocks. There's only one way to do it, I thought, and that's rock has to look like rock. And so I had these pieces of rock and put it together, and I think it came out pretty good. So then I had to work through the operational restrictions, and, and, and what took place is even the C-16, the small locomotive with a, with a spark arrestor, would not fit past this tipple. And so up at Hesperus, I keep a flat car as an idler and any other cars that uh, they have to use to switch this mine. It makes it fun, actually. They got to think about what they're doing. Again, another, another picture showing switching. And, and, and also it shows the relationship of the Hesperus mine to Hesperus. And you can see uh, the, the the station and the the water tank. And that's what it looks like today. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. How do you deal with uncoupling up there? Um, I have um, the, you know, what do they call it? The, the skewer sticks. And then you, you, there's room. One of the things I did was to make sure as I was planning this out, I would go in and, and test it and, and make sure that people could reach in without damaging uh, any equipment. Or structures. So Dale, that the un, only question I've seen in the chat so far is, um, when do you stain the trestle? Talking about Lightning Creek trestle, do you stain it after they're being built, or do you pre-stain the wood? So, um, yeah, say that again, Raman. When do you stain the timber for the? Oh, well, generally, what I do is I use Minwax pens to give it. Um, use a, like a golden oak and maybe a brown to to give some variation to the the trestle the edges like you see here and then um i'll often give the bent a, a wash of india ink and then once i get it constructed i i go back with india ink to give it more uh to, to, to darken it up uh, unfortunately the 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 camera, for some reason, uh, well, the phone camera makes the vents look lighter than they really are. Uh, yeah. But that's that's how that's how we do it. Okay. It, no, that was a, that that question came from um, uh, from Steve Hollenbach. and uh, Rod Jensen asked. Sorry, John Garrity asked. Uh, do you model sized coal from the tipple? Do I model what? Sized coal. Oh, size coal. Well, no, no, I don't get that into that much detail. Uh, Dale, uh, John Garrity, I'm a coal mine modeler. 
Uh, uh, the, f the first shoot that you get, the one that's closest to the mine, is actually under the screen. So anything small falls through and comes down that first chute. Yep. Yes. The larger run of mine coal goes over the top and ends out on the, the track furthest from the mine. So if you wanted to run sized coal, that's how where where the model coal would wind up. Now, prior to World War II, most of the money was in large coal. There wasn't any money in coal dust unless you had a coke ovens plant. Uh, you had nowhere for the, the, the real small stuff to go. Now, mm -hmm. in, anything smaller than about two inches uh, to one inch could be used for domestic home use, but the factories wanted big lumps of coal that they could kind of load into their manual boilers uh, that wouldn't smash up in transit between where it was loaded at the mine and where it finally got to the boiler. Again, there's no money in, in coal dust. Uh, you can't burn coal dust real easy in a boiler, uh, certainly not in the old hand shovel days. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where I'm coming from. If you wanted to run different size coal heading for different markets, it's pretty easy to do from that mine. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for that. No Thanks, worries. John. I'll, I'll yeah. go back to lurking. Let me let me look at the other questions on the chat, um, Dale. So um, Rod Jensen asked, I think I could answer this one, Dale, after Sunday, but Rod Jensen asked, where do the engines at West Durango get turned at Ute Junction? Uh, <clears throat> Well, in, 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 at the prototype, they were turned in Durango. And um, there was, I believe, actually, no, I believe there was a, a, a Y near West Durango. But for the layout, the closest Y is up uh, actually near Hesperus, between Porter and Hesperus. So it's just one of those things I have to pre-stage the locomotives uh, for an operating session. Just make sure they're, you know, headed in the right direction. And one of the things I know when we operate there is helpers coming downhill, we turn at that Y, so they come into West Durango, pointed the right way for the next session, right? Yes, that's yes, right, absolutely. Yeah. So Jake um, Sweeney asked, um, did you move the tipple structures when you rebuilt the mountain at Hesperus? You mean that I changed where, where I was locating it? Yeah. No, I all I did was build up the back of it, and and worked around it. But did, did you actually move the structures? The mine temple did that come off there to do the scenery? No, I didn't. I didn't. You mean can I can I take it off the scene? Yeah, was it fastened in there while you did the scenery? Oh, the rebuild? um, yes, it, it 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 is in it is in place. Some of it it's hard not to. Uh, have you know to make it look right and to make it look natural uh, to, to have it look right uh, and mostly up around the mine entrance as far as the the the, the trestle bents or the bents uh, that they're just they're they're just placed they're just sitting on the layout but up around the mine entrance that's worked in. And the final question on the chat, Dale, um, it's actually more of a comment, really, from uh, Greg Wright is, gorgeous layout. Hey, Robin, it's Mark in Dallas. Dale, when you were doing Lightner Creek uh, in the backdrop, you changed the clouds. It looked like you cut the clouds that you photographed out and replaced them with a different cloud formation. Am I correct? No, no. It, I... It was uh, the, the clouds that were printed just like you saw, and it was just a, a matter of uh, using that number 11 X-Acto blade, and, and I kept trimming away until it looked correct. Okay, so you used part of the clouds that you photographed on that day. Right, right. It, okay. was, all, all, it was all together. It was okay. the same, same photograph. Okay. Uh, Dale, okay. uh, a lot of people don't probably realize how 
uh, tedious it was for you to get the correct photographs. And uh, I know as we were chatting about the photographs, you made sure you took them all at the same time or under the same lighting conditions so that if you had to uh, piece together several uh, shots, you had the same or similar light conditions. Any comment about that? Well, typically I would go out in the morning and research where I could find uh, the scene that I wanted and, and, and access to it. It's just not easy. And, it's, and, and in the last 20 years, it's got even harder. But the, and then I would try to take it between noon and one o'clock. That is only because when you start stringing all these backdrops together, you, you, you want that same lighting as much as possible. The other thing I did too is the whole backdrop is painted the same blue. So you, it's just, you, you just cannot make it work trying to match the blue of one backdrop to the blue of another. So it's all been, and that's why I cut the clouds off and it seems to work pretty well. The only other comment I'll make, uh, over the years I've watched you detail Hesperus and the mine. Uh, as you come into the room, it is the first thing you see on your left. And um, your eye is drawn right down to the, from the top of the tipple down to the track in this, where the stream is and, and all of that detail. And what is amazing to me is you can look at this scene from the aisleway and you're looking downhill uh, and over the top of the of the mine structure, and your eye is not necessarily drawn across uh, the valley there to the de to the depot. <laughs> it's like two different scenes, even though they're like uh, 15, 16 inches apart. So it's it's a it's a a, a very effective outcome. I don't know whether you intended that way. But often, uh, a lot of layouts I've seen um, scenes blend together and they detract from each other. In this case, the mine is by itself. And then foot and a half away is the depot and, and the water tank and all that on the, on the, uh, the main line. Oh, thank you. A final question on the chat, uh, Dale, um, from Martin Wade saying that the scenery colors match the backdrops extremely well. And I can vouch for that, Martin. It's particularly around the Hesperus scene, uh, it's kind of seamless there. But do you have any comments, Dale, about how you actually managed to do that color matching between the foreground scenery and the backdrop? It, part of it's just keeping at it. It's Woodland Scenics. There's, there's nothing special about, you know, Woodland Scenics makes good products. I use a lot of burnt grass, which seems to work well to matching up to the backdrops. And a lot, and the other thing is to try to pull something that's in the backdrop and put it in the foreground. So I, you know, in the Hesper scene, there's there's little purple flowers here and there. And so Woodland Scenics had purple flowers, you can put it in the foreground. And what it does, it helps, you know, so that the eye just doesn't see the seam as well. It just kind of pulls things together. And it's really just keeping at it. Just put it down, see if it works. And the, the wonderful thing about scenery is it's very forgiving. If when it dries, it doesn't look quite right, well, we'll, we'll either take some of it out when, or add some to, to try and make it look right. But uh, yeah, Woodland Scenics is what I've been using all these years. So Keith Stamper says that, um... Uh, he made a, a video last year during a narrow gauge convention which, on his YouTube channel. So with your permission, Dale, you could put the link in the chat here so people can go and view his video. Oh, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. go for it, Keith. That's it for the chat. So um, thank you, guys. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. So I'll hand it back to you, Russ, to uh, close out. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Dale. And... Uh... And we look forward to seeing that video.